So just to echo what Vincent has said, I'd like to formally welcome uh, Minister of Transport and Tourism, uh, Mr. Minister Shane Ross, and also uh, Dr. Catherine Sapone, who is the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs. And uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out to, from your busy diaries to attend this celebration today. Um, but I'd also like to thank the, uh, our MC, Vincent, and the panellists who we'll hear from later. Um, and of course, everyone that's here, absolutely fantastic turnout, absolutely delighted that so many of you accepted the invite to uh, share with us our 10-year uh, anniversary of car sharing in Ireland. So I just want to take a moment um, just to give you a background and reflect on what has happened uh, to date. So just a, a brief background, Go Car was launched in 2008 and uh, way ahead of its time, it was a, a partnership with Cork City Council and um, really, if you look back that far, like what were they thinking? They, they really uh, put themselves out there as being innovators. In 2012, um, the organisation that I worked for, Executive Trust Limited, acquired GoCar and began to build a fleet and a membership um, in Dublin and Cork. In 2013, Dublin City Council introduced amendments to the bylaws regulating the operating of on-street car sharing clubs and ensuring that residents in the Dublin City had convenient access to car sharing and making it easier for people to give up their use of private cars. And this, we made sure there was a, a, an attractive an alternative to owning a car nearby. So things started to move along then in 2014. The, uh, the Department of Transport under the then Minister Leo Varadkar introduced new legislation which allowed for uh, new zoning for car club vehicle bays. So this was the real amendments that needed um, within, um, before um, the government had no power to be able to allocate car parking spots for uh, car sharing, and that legislation allowed for that to happen. In more recent times, we've had uh, expanded through our relationships with um, the councillors and staff within Fingal County Council, South Dublin County Council, and uh, Dunier Yurat Down, and we've had some massive support from those guys. And then uh, in 2017, as part of Europe, uh, European Mobility Week, we expanded into other uh, places, Galway, Limerick, Louth, and several other counties around. We've been supported along the way by Irish Rail, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it uh, later on, about the whole multimodal transport. Um, linked in with them is fantastic because they really see the benefit of the last mile delivery, which was what um, car, uh, Go Car provides. So the last few years, we've seen um, advancements in the, um, the technology that we've been using, and we're also working with um, Anne Graham and the, the team in the NTA to be able to use the, the Leap Card for members to be able to use the Leap Card for uh, accessing the Go Cars, and that was a real, again, a game changer for us. Um, Moving further on, then, we launched electric vehicles, and that wouldn't have happened without the support of Dublin City Council again, uh, BMW and Renault, and uh, also working closely with ESB. So what I'm really just painting a picture here is this is not just a go-car story. This is a story of uh, a lot of different entities coming together. In uh, this year, GoCar was awarded the best service provider from, by the SEAI at the, SEAI at the Energy Show. And We've seen more um, in, in 2018, so the local authorities and the Department of Planning embracing the idea of uh, changing the planning laws to allow for low car developments. And this is by including car sharing in their uh, mobility management plans. And th this sort of text was, wasn't used before. And the, the, um, the architects and the designers of these um, uh, are now including the, the use of not necessarily just go-kart, but just car sharing as, a, as a, uh, an offering. And that means when they go to build these new buildings, uh, they won't have to build as big basements. They won't have to uh, provide as many car parking spaces. And this is ultimately reducing the cost of the, the build costs. Well, hopefully pass on to the selling prices and then obviously reducing rents if the, uh, the properties have been rented out. So our journey today shows it's important to have the support of uh, local policy investment in um, national and local government and also the public bodies. And it's all about, for us, increasing the awareness of sustainable transport modes. So in 2016, um, the company GoCar was acquired by Europe Car Mobility Group. And um, their ambition is uh, to deliver an experience of open mobility for all, lifting all the barriers, giving individuals as well as groups of people easy access 
to this great new world of mobility solutions, wherever and whenever they want. And that really like, is a, a, a sort of a, a, a big statement to be making, but car sharing is very much part of that. So this event today is, uh, it marks also a change um, in what's happening with lo GoCar locally. Um, Colin Menton, who's in the audience, um, who's the retiring CEO uh, on the 1st of November, and he's retiring out of a hugely successful business. And um, uh, having spent spending 18 years in the business, I get the uh, chance to take over and try and fill his shoes as the man director for Europe Car Mobility Group in Ireland. Um, so, basically, what my it's a, the the picture here is to, like, to continue this uh, vision of um, delivering um, uh, a real alternative to vehicle ownership in Ireland, and um, I'm really looking forward to doing it. So the last three years, GoCar has seen a 600% growth in monthly journeys, and as of today, we have 500 vehicles and uh, 40,000 members. And using those numbers, um, we believe each one of those vehicles is taking between 20 to 30 private cars off the road. So already, GoCar, we believe, is making an impact in the places where those vehicles are, and we look forward to expanding that. So in 2019, we're looking to double again in size, so bringing over 1,000 vehicles, and we reckon we'll be doing uh, nearly 100,000 trips in a year, so that's nearly 150% growth, um, and like we'll continue to see the expansion over time. So uh, the freedom provided by the private car was undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly the biggest achievement in the 20th century, but these opportunities have been progressively offset by the number of vehicles on the road and the congestion and the pollution that has been created by those vehicles. Um, now with the, the digitization and the sharing economy providing the opportunity to reduce the number of vehicles in our cities by an order of magnitude, and we get a chance now to start seeing the end of the appalling cost of pollution, accidents and congestions caused by excessive car ownership that we see today. Cities need to embrace the idea of dissuading personal use of, um, of cars and making the cities more livable. If people own cars, it's pretty much, they own a car, they make a trip. And we have to start making a change about that. We have to start making um, it a real alternative that people don't need to own vehicles. And if they don't own a vehicle, they will use other modes of transport. They won't just switch to car sharing. They'll switch to using public transport. They'll cycle, they'll walk. So it's not just about the car sharing story. Um, as an, uh, an organization, we're acutely aware that nobody moves from private cars, okay? straight to go-car. That's just not what's going to happen. Um, so today is about talking about um, reducing car ownership, but this whole switch to uh, car sharing and multimodal transport. Um, and on that note, uh, I look forward to the conversation this afternoon. I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Minister Shane Ross, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you very much indeed, and thank you everybody for coming along. I, I was quite struck with what, what you had to say there about having such a good relationship with Dublin City Council, the ESB public bodies, and in particular with the Fine Gael government over the last uh, few years. Do you want a job? Do you? <laughs> uh, it, uh, it's extremely invigorating and energising to hear uh, such a good news story, particularly in the area of transport. Uh, I'm particularly in the area of reducing the number of cars on the roads because everybody would be aware here that that is government policy and has been for a long time. It's uh, succeeding. It's succeeding slowly. But any help that we get, of course, will establish a very good relationship. And we're working in the same direction. And the fact that you're working for it for a profit is a perfectly noble objective. Uh, the fact that we're working for it in a, for a more general public good doesn't mean that we're in any way on a collision course. We're not. We're, in, we're, we're moving in the same direction. And I hope that the result of your endeavours will be to continue to remove, what was it, 20 cars for every one that you put on the road? That's a pretty formidable achievement. You only have to produce about uh, another 500,000 if we sort out the, problem, the traffic problem. It's, it's OK. And we'll, we'll cooperate with you in any way we can. And, and thank you. Um, the future of multimodal transport is the theme of today's <coughs> events. Uh, if you're not immersed in the, in, the, in, in the world of transport policy, you may wonder what exactly this phrase means. Obviously, to the, to the average person outside here, the word multimodal is something which they have to think about before they actually realize what it, what it means. Um, 
but multimodal has become a uh, bit of a buzzword recently, I know, in transport circles, and you're a contributor to it being a buzzword and to be it being a successful project and a successful theme. And it was even the theme of this year's European Mobility Week back in September. So what does it, what does it really mean? It's all about getting from A to B using a mix of different transport modes, whether that's car sharing, cycling, walking, or public transport. And I think it's important to include, when I'm talking about multimodal, all the time to include the word cycling and walking. It's, uh, they're very, very healthy, and they're something which obviously can be encouraged. And walking in particular is, is at the moment several kilometers. It's faster, quite often, than going in a car, and obviously more, more healthy. If you were traveling from Dublin to Cork for a business meeting, rather than automatically taking your own car, you could instead cycle to the train station, connect to the Wi-Fi. It's a bit like Vincent's journey, but I don't think you connect to the Wi-Fi when on board, and do some work as you go. And then once you arrive at the station, jump in a go-car to finish the last stretch of your journey. Using transport in this way would help you avoid the traffic, avoid parking fees, and minimize the environmental impact of your journey. GoCar is doing great work in this area, and I wish to acknowledge that. And through partnerships with Irish Rail and the NTA, the National Transport Authority, and it's very good to see Anne Graham here, uh, it's reassuring to see our leading transport providers encouraging the public to mix and move when it comes to their daily transport choices. We're here today to mark GoCar's 10th anniversary, a significant milestone for the company and 10 years of car sharing in Ireland. But this event isn't about looking back, it's obviously about looking forward. When I launched my part of the government's project, Ireland 2040, linking people and places, that's exactly what we aimed to do. Our vision for the future is rooted in linking more people to more places, places which is why we're investing 19.7 billion euros in public transport and road networks. Car sharing is a crucial piece of this puzzle, ensuring that as we move forward, we increase the number of ways that Irish people can connect with each other and with their communities. Last year, GoCar expanded its service nationally to 18 counties in Ireland with hundreds of locations nationwide. And in the last three years, they have seen a 600% growth in monthly journeys, thereby linking more people to more places. My department has also been working hard to encourage the uptake of new transport technology. In 2017, there were 940 new electric vehicle registrations, up 33% year on year, the highest number recorded to date. That's a low base, admittedly, but uh, that is improving at a, very, at a very encouraging rate at the moment. Over the last two years, GoCar have facilitated 1,700 electric journeys with their fleet of 10 electric car sharing vehicles. Car sharing is an ideal way to introduce people to the benefits of electric driving. The software and shared cars can, can be used to alleviate range anxiety, ensuring that the battery level is always monitored and sufficiently charged for each new journey. It also gives people the opportunity to drive electric without the upfront purchase cost of an EV. There is no denying that the transport sector is now moving into a very challenging period. With over 2 million cars on Irish roads today and a big reliance on private cars for everyday transport, it's not surprising that urban traffic congestion is bringing our cities to a standstill every morning and every evening. We need to reduce the number of cars on Irish roads, and there is no skirting around this issue. Costs of insurance premiums are spiralling, with the average cost of running a family car now at €10,691 a year. Carbon emissions from the transport sector have been increasing year on year since 2013, and it's the fastest growing contributor to emissions in the country. Between 1990 and 2015, the transport sector's emissions grew by 130%. How can we curb these growing concerns at the same time that we plan for further population growth? By allowing multiple people to use the same vehicle at different times, car sharing reduces car ownership and dependency, traffic congestion, carbon emissions and air pollution, cost of transport, and frees up land 
traditionally used for parking spaces. The writing is on the wall. Multimodal transport is the future, and car sharing has a major role to play in reducing the number of cars on our roads. Walking, cycling, train, Lewis, Dart, bus, and car sharing. There are more options available to us now than ever before. So as a concluding note, I'd like to extend my congratulations to GoCar and the team behind them that has made their growth in 10 years of car sharing in Ireland possible. I'd also like to apologize. I'm actually on my feet in the Doyle in about 20 minutes, uh, answering a topical issue. So I have to, I have to leave. I'm, I'm very tight for time. But I'll leave you in the very safe and energetic hands of Catherine Sapone, who's here in an unofficial capacity, but undoubtedly will be able to tell me more about the panel discussion uh, and uh, I'm very glad to see her here with an interest in this subject, which is obviously something which is going to occupy our minds, and the minds of government and my department and my agencies for many years to come. So here's to the next 10 years. I look forward to seeing what they have in store, and I wish you well, and I hope you're back here in 10 years' time to see that you've rocketed through, you're quoted on the stock exchange, you, you've, got, you've made an enormous amount of money, but the problem, in, the problem in, in Dublin traffic has been solved as well. Thank you very much indeed. Colin, could I come to you first, seeing as you're the organiser of the event, so to speak? I'm just um, glad that bit is over. <laughs> it's a bit more relaxed now. Uh, and this is a relaxed and informal yep. discussion. Based on that, that survey that you commissioned to mark your 10th anniversary, uh, people's attitudes to, to car ownership, car sharing, uh, public transport, and, and, and the future of transport. It's still clear nearly 80% of all Irish adults own a private car. Over 50% use it daily to get to work. Another 20% of passengers need a private car. Without being negative about this, is it going to be a really difficult challenge to wean people off private car ownership? I don't think so. No, I, I, but I think we're talking about our growth already, doubling in size, and we're planning to double in size again. Um, I think the, the future is car sharing, right? So we're going to get there. How far into the future, though? Well, see, <laughs> this is where um, well, it's great to have this conversation now, because the more we talk about it, I think, and the more that we get it out there and, and keep the conversation going, the more people will get it and then realise that this is a real viable option. Um, I think the, the more... Um, educated and people understanding uh, what the service can provide. Um, I think there's plenty of people out there who don't actually realise how much their own car is costing them. They don't realise actually how much time it's sitting on the ground. And I think what we're finding is when people are joining our service, they're going, it's right for me now. And they've, they've known about it for a while, so something has happened. Either they're about to change a car or they were going to uh, the cars uh, failed an NCT test or whatever it is, and then they decide it's for them now. So if we keep uh, creating more of an awareness, um, I think it's going to accelerate, um, and, I, and I think that's what we're seeing now. So doub if you're going to keep compounding, doubling, 100% growth, like that's you're going to move quite quickly. So. And I know you're, you're taking over from from uh, from Colm. Um, uh, do you see that as one of the key <laughs> challenges of your role now to to educate people uh, about, I suppose, partly about the real costs of owning a car? Um, absolutely. I think the um, like you have people coming out, like the AA produce the numbers that we use in our statistics, so they're acutely aware of um, the, the growing need for people to understand where the cost of uh, fuel, cost of insurance, cost of maintaining a vehicle. Um, but I think people are seeing it in their pocket as well. So uh, the average age of cars in Ireland is, uh, is, is still quite old. I think the um, there's a lot of um, changes happening in the industry around electric vehicles, diesel, petrol, like so much happening, so much uncertainty. Um, so if people are looking to change their vehicle, um, maybe not owning it the next time is the way they're going to go. So I think that's what we're, we're trying to do is um, keep like having this uh, gathering here today, having the media here, having the, uh, the uh, I suppose all the interested parties, I think, Every time we go to them, the next time to say, look, we want to expand again, they'll go, oh, we get the story. We get where you're going with this. And uh, things will just become easier. And from the uh, National Transport Authority, uh, we heard Colm earlier saying, you know, obviously it is one of your objectives to, to uh, decrease the amount of, of private car use, use. But again, turning to that survey, in broad terms, uh, nearly 70% of people put down as their as the lack of, of viable and affordable public transport options was the principal reason they thought they wouldn't get out of their private car. 
Yeah, then we, we know that um, we need to improve the public transport right across the state and the National Transport Authority is working hard to deliver better public transport and not just in our cities but also in our rural towns and villages as well. And I think there's, there's two areas. We firstly have to increase and improve the services, but we also have to educate the public about the services that they actually have in their, loca in their locality, because there is a lack of understanding or of what actually is available. Um, and we find that as, as soon as we make that information more available locally, then people do start to use, and they are, they are inclined to use public transport um, where they can. And I think one of the, the, the things that um, will encourage car sharing is also um, improving the public transport. So if you begin to use public transport uh, primarily, you know, for all your journeys, and then um, you, you consider, do I need a car, my own car, to make the rest of the journeys? I think that would encourage then so uh, people to transfer. Approach. Yeah, transition approach. I, I think it'll be very difficult to get somebody to move from their own private car straight into uh, car sharing. I think the, the step change will be those people that use public transport and sustainable transport modes for most of their journeys <coughs> or for a good percentage of their journeys, then they would have to see, well, do I also want to uh, consider having my own car uh, for the rest of those journeys? So. I presume you do all sorts of surveys all the time about people's attitudes to transport generally. Were you surprised by that number, that, that near 70% number that said, I don't, I don't either have a, trust, a transport public transport option or it's going to be too costly or it's not going to be reliable? Um, yeah, it's a bit higher than we would have expected. Um, but then it does translate into usage. So we know transport uh, car usage is up around those levels. Not in the cities, you know, where generally we are seeing much lower levels of private car usage, uh, particularly uh, in Dublin. Um, so I think there's an education that, we, that we're involved in, which is about encouraging uh, people to use public transport and particularly those that haven't used public transport for a long time when they go back and start using transport public transport they can see the improvements uh, that are being made the price point now we would argue against um, uh, particularly city transport we think is reasonably um, um, a reasonable price given the leave cards that we have and the all the if you're a regular um, <coughs> transport user commuter you can get your journeys at a very low price. And, and again, that price comparison might come down to something Colin was touching on there, that, that a lot of people don't actually know the real cost of owning a car, including yes. depreciation. The, the, the minute yeah. you buy a car, it starts depreciating. Yes. Owen, Owen Keegan of, of Dublin City Council, I, I mean, you're a keen cyclist all your life. We know you have the stripes on your back <laughs> for trying to get more cars off, private cars off the city streets. Where does car sharing come into the mix for, for, for Dublin City Council? Well, we've, <coughs> we've always been supportive of car sharing um, going back uh, before 2013. <coughs> and I think we always recognise that, um, you know, there are a significant number of journeys for which, realistically, the car is the, the optimal mode. Um, the difficulty is that once people buy a car, the temptation is you've, you've, you've met all those fixed costs, you might as well use it for a whole lot of other journeys for which it's not... Sweat the asset. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if we can get people to defer or preferably not to buy a car uh, and offer them an option where they, they can have access to a car, it does seem to make sense. So it's, it's entirely consistent with our, our whole approach. Um, uh, and that's why we've been quite supportive and we're, we're delighted that it, it's showing at this stage now real significant growth. Um, like we, we, we don't just support it by uh, offering discounted access to you know, sort of parking uh, and, and a small number of dedicated spaces, but a particular significance that we're negotiating with developers now, uh, almost every new housing development, apartment development, uh, we're allowing developers uh, forego uh, off-street car parking in return for making arrangements with uh, provision from day one for car clubs. And that's been very successful. And that model, you know, is, is working very well in London, New York, where there's a whole generational thing here where um, I have children in New York and, and uh, in London who, who don't have cars. Uh, the companies they work for, very few people have cars. And the, the car sharing is, is has, it's at a much higher level there. There's no reason why I wouldn't get to that level uh, in Dublin. Sheila, I just heard you whisper super there in response yes. to, 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 to that initiative that, that uh, Owen was talking about there. How, how do we compare? You, you, have, you have the European stats uh, and perhaps global stats for, for car sharing and other forms of transport other than private ownership. Mm -hmm. How do we compare here in, in Dublin in particular, but Ireland generally, or do you know? 
So within the group, GoCar has a couple of sister or brother companies, Blue Move, Ubico, eCar. And we are today in 11 cities across Europe. And after Paris, you're number two. In size, you're also the oldest, so Paris is slightly younger than here. And to me, this shows, if you compare the size of Dublin to Madrid, which is smaller than you, Berlin smaller, where Berlin is the city of hipsters, so you would think car sharing is a big hobby there. I think you just mentioned we offer accessible parking. It's the key. It's one of the keys because people are not prepared to change their habits lightly. I mean, I don't know about you, in my life, I mean, I'm the only person in the executive committee of the Europe Car Mobility Group without a company car. So I live the life of the multi-model. I sometimes don't turn up to meetings because I miss something. Uh, but I don't do it voluntarily because I have so much other things in my life to think about. So if we don't make it accessible through technology and through places on the road in a collaboration with the cities where we are, we fail. So the cities where car sharing is developing the best is a city where there's a very close collaboration. And not just with the, the council, but also with the other means of transport. You were talking about multimodal. I noticed arriving here yesterday that there's hardly any multimodal option yet largely available in the city, like we're seeing in other cities, City Mapper, which is offering you all kinds of transport. In the future, you will be choosing your, your transport based on time that you have, money that you have, but also activity you want to have. Do you want to sweat because you need to do your step counter? Do you want to have a meeting? Do you need to study? Do you want to talk on the phone? That then determines, do I take a car? Do I take a taxi? Do I take a bus? So we need to have options in whichever shape or form where you can easily switch between those models. Because if you need to sign up for every single mode you need to have, it becomes a tedious journey. So I love your initiative of the Leap Card, which is one means of transport for both. Although we waited a long time for that Leap Card, yeah. but, uh, and I know Owen and, and Anne will probably want to come in and, and, and talk There's about one it. other thing. Oh. For instance, I think also where you can play a role as a country, citizen, government is what about company cars? Because what we're seeing is in, this, in the country, for instance, the, the country lowest uh, ready to take car sharing is Belgium. Why? Because every single job in Belgium comes with a company car. So I think also we all need to think about why do people get their company? Why don't we give them a wallet where they can use the variations of transport for their holiday, a big one in there during the weekdays, a car share? Um, we have some rental options across the world too that could help you. <laughs> that's the that's the ad, folks. <laughs> Sorry, I had to pay back my trip. We will come, we will come back to us. <laughs> Cara, thanks for your patience. Uh, and I know you're a, you're a very not at all. No, no, we we, we had to go in sequence. Um, you're, you're, you're a very high-profile environmentalist, not only with your work in UCD, but I know you're chair of Friends of the Earth across Europe. And um, I presume you're broadly broadly supportive as, as an environmentalist yeah. uh, w with, this, with this trend towards car sharing. Yeah, I mean, Colin was saying the future is car sharing, and, and I was going to say, well, actually, the future is sharing in general. I mean, uh, this kind of overconsumption, I think, is coming to an end. People are really sick of plastic. They don't want this kind of single-use <laughs> plastic anymore. Uh, and, uh, and they want to share. They don't want to own a drill that they may use a few times a year. They want to share that drill. They don't want to own a car. They want to share a car, and I think that's particularly prevalent in the younger generations. So sharing is is there, and particularly in transport here in Ireland, I thought it was interesting that the minister mentioned the spiraling emissions coming out of the transport sector. I mean, we're one of the only EU countries where our greenhouse gas emissions are increasing, not decreasing. A uh, very worrying trend, and a lot of that is coming out of transport as the economy grows and congestion increases again. So so car sharing is, is a key part of that solution. But one of the things that really stood out to me in Colm's talk was how essential um, working with national government, local governments, uh, transport, the transport sector is. And, and GoCar is very lucky that there's a champion to do that kind of integration. And I suppose the failing is that when you look at other transport options like walking and cycling, uh, there isn't that level of support to integrate all the networks um, to make that possible in other types of transport in the same way it has been with car sharing. That idea, I mean, I think of the, of the sharing economy, obviously, is, is, is very prevalent now, particularly among younger people. But, but, but 
do you not think perhaps that, and it comes out of the survey again, that people, uh, people know that private car ownership is causing congestion, they know it's causing uh, pollution, um, but that's a kind of an aspirational thing. When it comes down to it, one in uh, only you know, four out of five of, of rural drivers in particular could see no viable alternative to a private car. So people know what they should be doing, but to get them to, to move, to switch, yeah, I mean, I, I don't blame them. I, I would kind of disagree with, with, with Anne's optimism about the transport system. I actually think the public transport system is pretty poor in my experience. It's still much cheaper and much faster for me to drive from Bray to UCD than it is for me to take the bus. And as long as that's the case, uh, it's very hard for anyone, including an environmentalist, to justify switching to public transport. So, so uh, that is frustrating. But I suppose one of the things that came out of that survey is that 68% of people who were, who were surveyed acknowledged that, that there was a need environmentally to get out of cars. Is so that higher than you would have expected? I was quite optimistic about that because if you think about it, our government spends almost nothing on environmental awareness and, and, and so the, you know, people are learning about sustainability uh, out of their own goodwill and, and through the media, out of the media's goodwill, but um, for them to have that kind of environmental awareness and connect the dots is reassuring to me, but I don't think we can kid ourselves that it has to be financially viable. We can't expect people to pay more to do the right thing. It should be cheaper to do the right thing, and I think car sharing shows that it is cheaper to do the right thing. And I suspect you might want to come back to something Sheila said there about, about <laughs> yeah. planning your trips, but I suspect definitely it's something Karen said there. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, in terms of, I mean, Colin mentioned the, the figure of 10,000 uh, euros a year average cost. You know, there's very few public transport tr trips that would cost uh, an annual uh, 10,000 a year, you know, the, I don't think there is. You can actually travel on CIE, all of CIE services for 5,000 a year, you know, right across the state. So I know, we know that we don't have public transport offers right across the state, not to the level that we would like to have. That gives people, uh, particularly in rural Ireland, an alternative. Is that, is that ever really feasible in rural Ireland, given that, you know, we don't have any large urban centre apart from Dublin, really? Um, we think it is. I mean, we've been making quite uh, significant investment in, rural, ser in tra rural transport services and particularly linking, um, a lot of them are demand responsive, you know, so they are offering services from people's home to their local centre. Um, but we are, are really focusing more on connecting towns, uh, connecting individual towns. For the first time, we have a town service in Cavan. We're putting one in Monaghan. We're moving towards having a transport system uh, for the first time in Kilkenny, where we haven't had services before. You know, so we are driving not just better services in our cities, but also in our rural towns and villages and connecting those rural towns and villages. But it's, we can't um, provide the level of service that you'd be able to provide in terms of frequency in the cities. So we still think there's, unfortunately, there's still a need for cars as part of our transport system. Um, but the movement towards car sharing certainly kind of reduces um, the impact. Of course, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just, uh, the reason it's cheaper for me is because I have an electric car, so my fuel costs are obviously sure. quite minimal, so that's, yeah. it's not cheaper oh. for anyone, so I should Okay, okay. Uh, just staying with you, Anne, just for a second. Uh, again, from the survey, the, the principal reason people said they might be encouraged or coaxed or prodded <laughs> To, uh, to get into car sharing, as I think from private yeah. car ownership, mm -hmm. is the cost of running a car, and particularly the cost of insurance, um, as distinct from, you know, feeling better about the planet or, or whatever. Does that, I mean, does that sort of return, does that, does that really need to prod policy that we probably need to use more of a stick to get people to change their behaviour rather than dangle a carrot in front of them? Well, I think it's a combination. Um, I mean, people uh, respond um, to both you know, the carrot and the stick, you know, so I don't think people generally, we uh, humans, human nature doesn't like to <coughs> respond to the stick all the time. So in terms of cities and city services and encouraging more people to use um, services, public transport and sustainable transport modes in the cities, we have to have a service, an improved service, but also you have to do the stick, which might be you know, uh, the... Tax on lack, fuel or whatever. Yeah, or the availability of parking or mm. parking charges or other elements that have been put in place to try and discourage people from bringing their car into the city centre. Um, and we will be bringing forward proposals where more road space is going to be required for public transport in the future as well, particularly for bus transport and cycling infrastructure. Uh, and that also has an effect on dampening down car usage. If, if you look at the, um, 
where say Dublin has come and when Dublin bikes came into the country everyone nearly laughed at it like who, who's gonna cycle a bike and like everyone said like that's never gonna work and I think we're one of the most successful um, cities in Europe and, and, and that's since been rolled out to other cities in, in Ireland and, like there, there is a, a something well, it's not off piece from here but like, like that, that, that just shows that people's willingness to want to change like there is like there's people cycling around in the Irish weather that people have said that would never happen. I know you see um, people going down to the four courts with their wigs and their and their and their. The, like the, everyone is using them. So this is. I, I think we talked about the the way um, the consumer needs to. This needs to be convenient. We need to switch and try and provide. I, I, like uh, there's a gap. I think always in public transport for everyone, no, no matter where you go. But if we provide more public transport. It, I, the whole stick about taxes and stuff like that, I don't know, I wouldn't be a huge advocate, but like, if we provide a huge uh, benefit in terms of people not needing a car, provide the on-street par on parking, give them the visibility that this is easier, I think people will switch. I think it's because it is smarter. I think people realise this is like the clever thing to do. Why do I need to own? Like the whole idea of sharing. It's becoming much more visible. Look at Netflix, look at, like people used to go down and get, uh, uh, rent DVDs, like it's gone. People just want to consume and pay for what they need when they need it. And if, we, if, if, if everyone can come together, whether it's um, uh, the public, local government, um, everyone comes together, I think that's a real, real solution. Owen, is there more the city could be doing? Um, I did put this question to Owen beforehand, so I know the response. But um, I mean, for instance, <laughs> just for instance, I mean, you know, maybe allowing uh, people who, who use car sharing to use the bus lanes. Uh, well, I, I, I certainly wouldn't support that. I mean, at the end of the day, a car-sharing car, it may be uh, uh, more acceptable than a, a single or traditional privately owned car, but it's still a car. So uh, I don't think I wouldn't favour I think it's a decision for the minister, but uh, I don't think the city council would favour compromising uh, the current public transport uses primarily of, of bus lanes. Uh, and there's a danger. We already have, uh, and there's going to be a lot more buses, and there is congestion in bus lanes, but I wouldn't advocate uh, allowing any other feed and that could would also include electric vehicles who are constantly looking to get in electric so uh, no i wouldn't uh, i wouldn't uh, that's the bridge too far right i i also don't see car sharing as i i as a kind of a substitute for the use of public transport for commuting major commuting trips i mean the reality is if you want to get into the city you're going to have to do it by a sustainable mode for a whole lot of other trips and to discourage people from owning their own car i think it has a role to play but I really don't see it as making a major contribution in terms of uh, morning and evening peak commuting in and out of the city. Speaking of the stick, I mean, do you, unless we change our behaviour quite radically, and I know I know Anne has plans for that, uh, controversial plans mm -hmm. in terms of the bus connect, uh, which I suppose we could be here till five o'clock if we got into it. But do you see a congestion charge perhaps coming down the road if we don't change our behaviour? Um, well, I, I, I have a. Congestion charge is a complex one. Um, like, unfortunately, the major incentive, in my view, to motor change has actually been congestion. Uh, and congestion mm. imposes a huge time penalty. It's not, you don't actually pay you know, out of your pocket, but you're actually, there's a huge delay factor. So it has the same effect. It may not be the most efficient way. It would certainly be more economically efficient to have a, a, an actual charging structure. Politically, I don't think that's on. But the reality is that uh, car commuting trips into the city are becoming longer and longer. Uh, what amazes me is the tolerance of drivers for that. Uh, it, it has, I suspect, has been a major factor in, in the, achieving the modal change we've achieved, but there's still a, a significant proportion of drivers who have an, an extraordinary appetite for congestion, which, which <laughs> never ceases to amaze me. Because they don't want to get wet. <laughs> May I? Yes. Um, you're making a very important point here, and I know that in, in, in Dublin your experience with car sharing is what we call zone-based car sharing. So you collect the car, you go somewhere and you come back. Meaning you use it for those trips where the train doesn't go. I don't know whether you have a train to Ikea. No. no. Bus. There's a bus. Okay, but then still you cannot take the package on the bus. So what we see across Europe... <laughs> no, but what we see across Europe is that station-based or zone-based car sharing is a typical use case of between 5 and 48 hours. You use it to visit the family, to go to a cultural event, to go to Ikea. You typically use it to go out of town. I don't think, I think there's a very small percentage of our users who uses car sharing for commuting. Actually, if we look across the user base in Europe, our cars are typically used between 20 and 50 times per year by the same user. 
So for us, we are very, very strong opponents of what we call station-based car sharing, as opposed to free floating, which is pick up here, drop off there. I live in Paris. We, some of you may know about O2Leap, what's happened there. That's something that is unsustainable in my view because you are competing with buses and taxis. So you're bringing more cars. You just bring more cars on the road. Yeah. And so for you, to, free floating is just 20 minutes. It's your short trip, you pick it up here, you drop it over there, and you don't care about it. So we really believe that station-based or zone-based car sharing is an additional component to a portfolio of services. Cara, we all know the impact of, of, of pollution in particular in terms of the, the impact on the climate, which is a, a very worrying development. But honestly, in terms of our individual behavior, yeah. How influential is the Irish weather? You know, even people who are committed to car sharing or getting on a bike or whatever, you know, if it rains, how, you know, yeah, from only individual, how, how comforting is it to see that piece of metal and four wheels outside your drive? Yeah, having lived all over the world, I think you're, you're giving Irish weather a, an unnecessarily hard time because, mm -hmm. because in other parts of the world, it's just too darn hot. You know, you don't want to go outside because it's 100 degrees outside or something. So um, actually, our, our weather is relatively mild. Um, you know, not today, obviously, it's a little bad. But so so I, don't, I don't think weather, I mean, I don't have the, the studies on this, but I don't think weather is necessarily the, the factor. Um, when I looked at taking public transport here today versus driving my car, it added an extra hour on my journey to take public transport. So that, I think, is the issue. It's time. So even with Dublin congestion, it's still... Um, you know, it's still faster for people because of a lack of connectivity um, to, to perhaps uh, drive. And so unless we have congestion charges or unless the congestion gets worse, it gets harder and harder to argue that, that public transport is the option. Which I know you're working on, Anne. Um, the future of transport, and I will open this to the floor in exactly two or three minutes. Exactly two or three minutes. How precise is that? Um, the whole question of autonomous vehicles, um, particularly public transport vehicles, uh, yeah. self-driven, um, how soon are they practical on our streets and will they, will they help in, in, ter in terms of both multimodal and reducing congestion? Well, I, I make the distinction between public transport vehicles, as in, you know, large public transport vehicles and cars in terms of autonomous cars, because our view is that autonomous cars, other than car sharing cars, um, privately owned autonomous cars are only going to add to congestion. Mm. It's just replacing one for the other. In terms of autonomous um, public transport, and yes. I know, I know there, was a, uh, there was some piloting yeah, in the docks that's right. recently. Yeah, <coughs> you will see, we will see those uh, on our streets. Um, we will certainly see them on more on the rail tracked based systems initially. Um, but I do see that we will at some stage see, um, particularly if we have very uh, dedicated bus lanes along our core corridors, um, I think you could see that moving into autonomous bus fleet as well. Within 10 years, practically? Oh, I'd hate to be <laughs> the one to predict. Um, 10 years, possibly, maybe a little bit more, but at some stage. Sheila, I know your company, Your Car, has, has acquired a, an electric scooter company yeah. in Belgium recently. Yeah. Um, do you, have you plans to, and I, there are issues here, and I was talking to Owen about it, and I might bring Owen in on this, are, are scooters in an urban environment going to be part of, and particularly shared scooters, going to be part of the mix? We acquired this company in Brussels because we were intrigued by the setup. I was saying, Brussels, bad weather, why would people do that? Obviously, it's such a congested city. These are electric scooters, it's free floating. It's doing re much better than I expected uh, because it's used to go maybe to your car share, so you're using it to add on to your trip. We are right now in investigating uh, how to connect the service to our additional services, and we are very open uh, and quite serious about looking to moving into, into different cities. I think the real question is how are city governments going to work with scooters, bikes, what a push scooters, all of those things He's left here. on the pavement. He's here. He's pavement. Here. But this is that, no, what I mean to say is some of the cities are flooded. I mean, I'm in Paris, we're flooded with all kinds of free floating mm. elements on the pavement. There will come regulations, this needs to be organized a little bit. The good news is an electric scooter is not as easy to move around as something else. So we are experimenting with it. We're keen on it. Oh, and your view on it? Yeah, well, um, interesting. We, we had a group over from San Jose. with the Dublin's twin with San Jose. And uh, they have rolled out about, well, a private company's rolled out about 1,500 electric scooters. And uh, 
they said the, the impact has been quite phenomenal. There's been a huge take up. There's clearly a cohort of people for whom, despite its success, and we acknowledge that the Dublin bike scheme, we believe, has been very successful. Uh, there are people who won't go on a bike, and there seem to be those people seem to be some of them seem to be attracted to the electric scooter for those short journeys. But again, to the extent that they can come in by public transport and make those short journeys during the day by scooter, so it's something we're lo actively looking at. I mean, there clearly are issues and their safety concerns and there's a whole question we won't be allowed kind of free access people to just come in we, we'll have to see how we'd regulate it but it's something we're, we're actively looking at because we think it, it could make a contribution um, just on um, I know Sheila you were talking about no system aggregating um, all the different transport options um, I have to give Owen and his team uh, a lot of credit they're uh, currently have a um, a lot of company or five or six companies um, put into a feasibility stu study to create a smart mobility mm. hub here in Dublin City Council's offices. And that's where they have a vision where they would like to have a service where there's shared cars, shared bikes, um, shared electric bikes, um, and have the employees of Dublin City Council not have to use their own cars to get into the city, but then have a range of services. And uh, GoCar is one of the companies uh, putting together a feasibility study among other companies so we're not the only company and they've had a, an open uh, discussion around this and it, it, like we need innovation we need companies to think differently we need um, like the, the, the large um, multinationals that are out here based in, the, uh, in Ireland but also the small SMEs to be thinking about Sheila touched on it like wh why, why do employees need to take a car into the city yeah. like if there is public transport how can they be incentivized I just want to bring that back around because it, it, like we need companies to step forward and say, look, we're going to do something different here. And like the, a lot of companies have corporate and social responsibility, and they're sort of they, they say they, they they have it or they, they talk about it, but like they need to be looking to actually actively promote it within their employee and their, and their welfare, I, including in terms of the mileage that they pay for people, which is an yes. incentive to have a company car. <laughs> Sorry, folks, for leaving it so late, open it to the floor. Um, there's two roving mics, and you might introduce yourselves as well, so that whoever you direct the question to knows who you are. Um, gentleman there with his arm raised. Yeah, there's a mic behind you. Hello, uh, Pat Barry from the Irish Green Building Council. Well, first of all, congratulations to uh, GoCar. This has probably been one of the most fantastic innovations in the past 10 years in the potential to improve our built environment. Um, first question. Um, we're going to build 550,000 new homes over the National Development Plan. Uh, we need to ensure that not one of those um, occupants of those homes is fully car dependent. What is the minimum density needed to make uh, car sharing viable for each of those homes? In terms of how many people we need to be signing up? Yes. I mean, is there a minimum, say, number of units per hectare that can uh, support, uh, how far will people walk to a, a, to so, a, a, goal, a goal station? So there are sort of ideology is that a car is as convenient to them as possible, first of all. So uh, we know that the cars that are busiest, the people who use those are closest to those vehicles. So um, we try and get vehicles within a five minute uh, walk from where they work or live because it's the, the two parts of the, the equation. Um, but it's all about, again, usage. So like it could be um, two or three families using it multiple times a day, or it could be 30 families using it once a day. Like it's, it's, it really, it's, um, the, the makeup is very, uh, very different. But to, to answer your question, like every estate in the country that's going to be built, any, every apartment block should have access to some sort of shared mobility. Uh, and well, what we'd like to see First of all, is that any um, <coughs> residential um, developments would be located close, particularly large uh, residential developments would be located close to public transport infrastructure, you know, and where they haven't got public transport infrastructure adjacent to them or in the future, then you would look at the um, go car option. But I think for large scale developments, particularly in our cities, we have to be moving those close to existing and proposed public transport systems. Gentleman beside you there. Yeah. Thank you. Mark Pollard from Hibernia Reit. And can I just stress that this question is not related to the uh, DCC area, Owen, who um, your team are always very uh, pleased to discuss projects. Um, 
It's probably aimed at Anne, and it, it relates back to the last question. Where one has a major residential scheme being planned, which will obviously help with the, uh, the housing crisis, and at the same time, largely through private funding, one could significantly enhance a, uh, a multimodal transport hub. Uh, why is it so difficult to actually get to talk to anybody in the transport bodies to discuss it? Well, <laughs> you obviously haven't approached me. Uh, <laughs> let's just say maybe some of the, your uh, chief executive colleagues in, in, a, in a couple of the other bodies. But, uh, but I'll talk to you afterwards. Thank you for the invitation. Well, we... we <laughs> <laughs> We actually fund the infrastructure, particularly in the cities, so, and we provide the services. So we, we actually provide the services. So I think rather than trying to speak to the, my colleagues in the individual operator companies, you, you're quite welcome to come and try and talk to me. We're delighted. Thank you, man. Just behind there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Jerry Cash from carcharger.ie. Um, I'm looking to change my car next year. I'm actually going electric. And I was speaking to a supplier uh, company and what they said to us was, or what they said to me was, this will be the last time you'll buy a car. And they said that technology is developing so fast that definitely within 10 years, when you want to go somewhere, you'll go into the app on your phone and you'll call the phone, it'll come to your home <clears throat> or wherever and bring you wherever you want to go. And they said that the uh, technology is happening a lot faster than people realize. So my question really to the uh, Go Car and the Europe Car people, um, is this something that you're looking to trial somewhere in the world? And obviously, how soon do you think that that might come to Dublin? And what do you mean then with this? Autonomous driving. Uh, to, to, to make a trial, I know there are, I think we've had a trial of autonomous vehicles in Dublin already. Um, to actually make a practical commercial trial of a shared uh, vehicle which is autonomous, that will go... Uh, that to, will actually come to you. That will go to you, drop you where you want to go, and then take off itself and go and, and pick up somebody else. Yes, well, obviously, I, I'm not here to discuss <coughs> projects that we're looking at. I go on. But we are looking... <laughs> <laughs> um, for us, these kind of experiments are done in a conglomerate. It cannot be... Europe car itself, who does it, you need a company who has all the artificial intelligence to know where people are going. So yes, we are in discussions with car makers, with all kinds of parties to, to come to some kind of an experiment. And if anybody here in the room wants to experiment with us, please get in touch. Because this is really, you cannot do this on your own. You need all kinds of, of parties to do, this, to do this together. I just wanted to comment on another thing that you're saying is, it is true, I really believe, no matter whether it's autonomous or not, in 10 years from now, when no one will own a car, you'll have a subscription. And it doesn't matter whether it's autonomous or not. You'll have a subscription which allows you maybe 20 modules with a cabriolet because you're in the south of France, and then maybe two times a big van because you will, you will need to move, and then a small city car, and then additionally to that comes a package deal with public transport, etc. Car, And this is where the car owners, the car manufacturers are also moving. They're moving away from selling you a car, they're moving into offering you the usage of a car. And this is where companies like ourselves can play a big role because, if I may remind you, car sharing is car rental. It's just packaged differently and we've been doing this as an organization for the last 70 years. Just here on the, so there's a number here, we won't, we won't let him. Um, sorry, Joe Borza from uh, Energy Elephants and our startup. Um, have you looked at putting cycling parking infrastructure beside the car shares? Because I know myself, I, would, I wouldn't walk to a car share, but I would cycle to it. And then I have the ability of, of using the car share. And then secondly, would you stick one of those electric scooters in the boot? <laughs> <laughs> so um, to answer your question, that, that's what we try and do. Um, there is s some of the go cars, I don't know off the top of my head, that are parked right beside uh, the cycling um, stations, the Dublin bike stations. Um, like this is again working with Dublin City Council and working with all the councils around the country to try and create these hubs where we, where it's not just the bikes, it's the, the Lewis, it's the Dart, it's the train, and um, absolutely makes sense that those hubs are used to connect vehicles up. Um, so th there is vehicles out there that are right beside uh, um, stations. Would we like to have more? Absolutely. Um, the difference is. 
and this is where the challenge for us, um, Owen touched on it uh, briefly about the support he's, um, uh, the, the Dublin City Council have shown for uh, GoCar, about the dedicated spaces. Yeah. And dedicated spaces are, like, originally we said it was all about dedicated spaces, and we needed them. And now we've realised actually they're not as important as uh, we first thought. Um, it is key to have them in, in, um, in really highly um, populated areas where parking is z zero. But what we're finding, our expansion is in, in, we look for streets where there's ample parking and our vehicles park on anywhere on that street. So um, where we might have decided if we wanted to have a car right beside a, a, bike, a bike station, that, that street might have been 500 metres long and the car might have been parked at the other end of the street. So um, um, what, by not having dedicated spots has allowed us scale up much quicker. <coughs> Um, because we don't have to be looking to get car parking spots painted. We don't have to go and talk to loads of different uh, people within the, uh, the different councils to get those spaces allocated. So I think it's a, a probably um, making that decision for us was one of those real sort of game changers where we thought we needed something and when we re realised actually it wasn't as important, it was more to get the support and get the visibility on the street was actually more important. Gentleman out on the right wing there. Hi, my, my name is Brian Byrne, um, and this is really a question for Anne, I think. Um, I'm a multimodal traveller today to this event because uh, I live in a place called Kilcullen in County Kildare, and I drove 10 kilometres from my home to uh, Newbridge Station. I found a parking space with a bit of difficulty, and then I took a train to Euston Station, took a Lewis to across the river, and walked to here. I think that's as multimodal as you're going to get today. Um, and Beyond five years ago, I could have done that trip on one bus trip from my hometown into Dublin. But over this last five years, we have lost, for we've gone from 19 buses a day to I think it's something like four or five into Dublin uh, because uh, the pri both private bus operators and bus Aaron <laughs> dropped Kilcullen and Castle Dermot and a whole bunch of small villages off their route because it was cheaper and maybe more efficient to, to uh, go straight to Dublin. And I want to know, why did you allow, sorry, why did your organisation allow that? Because it's replicated all over the country and there's a whole bunch of villages and towns around the country who can't use public transport because it's no longer there. Well, um, we regulate the commercial uh, bus transport system as well um, and we regulate it on the basis of demand for transport. So uh, these are commercial operators and Bus Aaron operates part of its business is on a commercial basis. So its expressway business is commercial. Um, and it makes decisions about um, how it can make the, it commercial. And they've had difficulties, Bus Aaron, over the last number of years, very public um, difficulties. Um, and operators that are operating on a commercial basis have to make choices about how they, um, have to, what they serve in order to be uh, commercial. And they have, as the motorways have been developed around the country um, to benefit us all, the impact that has had is that uh, the commercial operators have moved towards the intercity business, which is connecting our major cities uh, to the capital. They see that as the most lucrative, the most commercial, um, and it means, and the journey times on the motorways have obviously been um, uh, reduced uh, as well. And that's the biz where the business is for them. So when a commercial operator comes to us to say they want to make a commercial decision about their business, we can't refuse that. You know, they're making decisions uh, on a commercial basis. What the authority then uh, is trying to do is where there are towns and villages that have been left behind because they are off the motorway, is to put back uh, a a connection and make sure those connections uh, are in place. And if we haven't achieved it in Kilcullen, then we may need to look at that again. It's nearly 10 past two, folks. Maybe one more if there is a lady here. There's a microphone coming to you now. Hi, I'm Ola. I'm from Arab Consulting Engineers. So I've heard lots of really positive things about what I think everyone has suggested is the future of mobility, and all of them seem to me to be components of mobility as a service or some of the aims of mobility as a service. You know, we're talking about reduction in car ownership, yet access to cars through car sharing and forcing, well, encouraging people onto public transport and reduction in emissions. So I was wondering, is there any particular vision or any plan from any of you um, for the introduction of such a service? 
Well, I might just uh, speak about um, one of the issues that we probably haven't covered is the technology around payments. Mm -hmm. So, um, like we have the Leap Card, which obviously is you know a, a means of payment for public transport and also assists on the, with uh, Go Car as well. But it's all the information is on your card, and so it it has built-in inflexibilities associated with a card-based system. So what we as an authority now want to move to is an account-based system. Um, so moving the how you pay um, to you holding an account. And once we get that flexibility about having an account of what you can offer uh, post your travel, whether it's travel by bus, public transport, go car, you know, we may be able to put in place a payment system that will allow you much more multimodal, and, but also offer you discounts associated with the type of travel that you, you do as well. So that's in our plan as part of the National Development Plan, moving that forward. Put a time on it, huh? Sorry? Put a time on it. Oh, three to four years, I'd say that kind of timeline. Folks, we'll leave it there. I'd like to thank Owen, Anne, Cara and Sheila, and I think Colin wants to say just a few departing words to you. Um, yeah, so like today was um, obviously uh, in part about a celebration of 10 year anniversary for GoCar, um, but I suppose the conversation up here has been, I suppose, enlightening for me because unless we, again, I mentioned earlier, unless we talk about this and continue talking about it, it's um, the more conversations we create, the better it's going to be for everyone. Um, these days don't sort of happen without uh, a lot of people putting in a lot of effort, a lot of work. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, very quickly the panel. I'd like to thank Vincent for moderating. I think he did an excellent job, very well read up on, on the questions coming in and, and being able to keep it going. Um, the, the team in uh, Europe Car uh, and the team um, within Go Car, unbelievable effort uh, and working with our partners, um, Teneo, PSG, um, obviously facilitated getting everything here together. But to own, and uh, we have uh, Kevin Mead and Christopher Carroll down there who work for Own, and is, uh, the, the main links that we would have with uh, for car sharing, like absolutely, the, the support has been unwavering, and I really do look forward to um, uh, working with uh, Dublin City Council and the rest of the councils that are here to expand the service. Um, we're hosted in this fantastic room. Um, everyone should just have a look at that wall. That's 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 history there. Um, and I really appreciate you having us here and I uh, look forward to working with you in the future. And thank you, everyone here, for taking your time out of your day. And I look forward to, um, I'll be around having a chat. If everyone wants to have a talk, please come up and say hello. Thank you.